return of stagflation, stocks down, and gold and silver up. And last week, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand lifted its cash rate to 2% and projected that it will hit 3.25% by the end of this year and almost 4% by the middle of next year. And the Kiwis do have a CPI problem, uh, still lower than the US. Uh, the RBNZ predicts peak inflation or peak CPI at 7%. But they're lifting rates and mortgage rates are going up. And as my buddy Tarek says here, it's well worth keeping an eye on Kiwi property as a bellwether of where things may be heading. And the New Zealand Central Bank Governor Adrian Orr said the bank needs to raise interest rates at pace to prevent inflation expectations from becoming unanchored. And that is what central bankers worry the most is inflation expectations. If the public believe that inflation is going to continue to remain elevated or, or even grow, then they'll lose faith in the currency and they'll try to get rid of that currency. And well, you guys know how the story ends. And Charlie Bellello shares this chart. I love his charts. Uh, the New Zealand uh, central bank hiking rates for the fifth time in the last year to now 2%. So it raised 50 basis points to 2%, which you can see in blue. CPI is right on 7%. Uh, so they've got a, a real rate of negative 4.9%. But if you go a little bit above that, you can see Canada, uh, their rate is 1%. Uh, the US 0.88 and Australia 0.35. Now I've shared this chart before. Uh, with Auckland, you can see the first three months, so the first quarter of this year, house prices down 4.5%, and in Wellington, the first quarter of this year is down 6.4%. And I am hearing uh, April and May, it's continuing to fall. Now, with regards to Canada, uh, you saw that chart from Charlie Bellello. They're half what New Zealand's done, yet from yahoo.com, Toronto home prices drop most in two years as rates slam market. Uh, my buddy Tarek says the average price of a home in Canada's largest city declined 6.4% in April from the month before on a seasonally adjusted basis. Rates were only raised at the start of March. Things are unfolding far quicker in Canada than in New Zealand. And coming in from Reuters, uh, the median price is down 8.9% in the 58 days of data since the Bank of Canada raised rates. And here's proof with this chart. Uh, retail goods sales per capita are 20% above pre uh, cervasa sickness levels. And this is from Morgan Stanley. And we have brought forward demand by creating all this new currency, creating all this new demand, whether it's for housing, uh, other financial assets, or actual goods. At the same time, we locked down the economies, we destroyed production, we destroyed supply, and we're wondering why we have prices going ballistic. And this is a great chart that shows why I do believe that central banks are going to raise rates higher and faster than any of us originally thought. And that's because the bottom 90%, so the majority of voters, uh, you know, the poor and the middle class, uh, the share of U.S. consumption, 78%, is held by the bottom 90%. Well, they only own 11% of U.S. stocks. With the top 10%, own 89% of all the stocks, yet they only share in 22% of consumption. So with inflation hurting the bottom 90% compared to the top 10%, uh, this is where it becomes a political issue. And so politicians put pressure on central bankers to do something about it. Um, and so this here, I, I, yeah, and, and a lot of people think that, well, you know, as soon as the markets go down a little bit, then the central banks will come in and save it. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the best thing I can do right now is share a little clip from Joseph Wang.
you know, I hear whether it's on Twitter Spaces or, or talking to people or, or reading some, some thought uh, think pieces that, oh, crypto is crashing. The Federal Reserve, it has to save crypto. Or, oh, this SPAC is crashing. Oh, this this highly speculative company is worth, you know, you know five cents on the dollar what it was a year ago. The Federal Reserve is going to come in and save me. Joseph, why is that thinking flawed? And why is, is just focusing on inflation the right way to go? Yeah, those guys need to wake the beep up. <laughs> and the ECB is warning that a house price correction is looming as interest rates rise. Eurozone house prices are set for a correction as interest rates start to rise in response to higher inflation, posing greater risks for low income households. And Hoz shared this chart, which, yeah, as we were seeing rising CPI prior to 2008 and the Fed tried to combat that, we had a market crash. Well, it did create a uh, financial meltdown, didn't it? Uh, and he argues now uh, that central banks will try to fight this inflation and we're going to see a much bigger fall in the S&P 500. And when we look at uh, this topping pattern, uh, it can be spotted on pretty much every major bear market of the last 100 years. Uh, not saying that 1929 is going to happen again. I uh, don't think it will. I think definitely central banks will jump in before it gets to that point because then that will probably create a financial system meltdown. And credit markets will freeze. And that's where I think, that's the point where I think central banks will step in. I think central banks right now will be happy for house prices and asset prices, stocks, you name it, to fall. Up until the point that it freezes credit markets and creates uh, systemic risk in the financial system. Uh, and and that it's at that point, uh, in my opinion. So how far can they fall? Well, we don't know. We'll keep an eye on it until we start to see uh, cracks in the financial system. And Jesse Felder shares this article from Bloomberg with Bridgewater's Greg Jensen warns that markets are still overly optimistic. Jesse uh, shares what, what Greg said in that article. Roughly 40% the US equity market can only survive essentially with new buyers entering the market because they're not cash flow generating themselves. And that's near a historic high. That's like basically right in line with 99, 2000. Beware, guys. Beware. And now we've got iceberg lettuce at $7 each. And all the talk of a windfall tax equals less supply equals high prices. These elites, politicians, economists, whatever, just have no idea what they're talking about. So you really need to be careful who you listen to. Uh, you know, most economists have no idea uh, what they're what they're doing. Uh, they they just use models. They put aggregates together, and they don't realize that the economy is made up of human beings, uh, human action, interacting with each other, making human subjective value choices. You can't just pull a lever and expect the whole economy to turn left. You can't just press a button and expect all consumers and all human beings to turn right. And this is what they don't get. They use aggregates, they use models, and it's flawed. And they're always so wrong. So you just need to be very careful uh, who you listen to. And Stephen Kakala says that it is looking more likely that inflation will be close to 9% by the year end. This will be a huge issue, obviously, that needs to be addressed aggressively now. The policy areas of the RBA and Morrison government are something to behold in a very bad way now. Look, he's a Labour guy, so he, you know, uh, take that with a grain of salt. But he is right regarding the RBA, uh, regarding uh, CPI as well. So, you know, we saw what the CPI is in New Zealand and where their rates are rising and, well, where Australia is likely to uh, head as well. And grocery inflation to hit double digits by mid-year, says Australian Food and Grocery Council CEO. Businesses are at a tipping point where they need to pass some of these costs through in order to remain viable. Oz Food Grocery CEO Tanya Barden shared at Cedars Supply Chain Discussion. So uh, there's a lot of firms who haven't passed on the input costs, the inflation costs that they've experienced in their businesses. 
inflation is going to get much, much worse. And here at the World Economic Forum, speaking about small and medium businesses in Davos, Norwegian finance CEO Kirsten Brathen says energy transition will create energy shortages and inflationary pressures, but this pain is worth it. I've been warning about this for a long, long time. I've done videos recently about it. Um, but, you know, it's just the economics. It's plain and simple. And now, you know, they're all admitting it over at the World Economic Forum at the moment. So, yeah. We need to accept that there will be some pain in the process. Uh, the pace that we need will, uh, will open up for missteps. Mm. Uh, it will open up for uh, shortages on energy. It will create inflationary pressures. And maybe we need to start talking about that, that that pain is actually worth it. Because if we don't, uh, there's no business yeah. case, okay. there's no economy, there's, there's no welfare. But, but so far, I think we are, have been a little bit careful actually talking about the pain in the short term that is likely to come from, from, the, from this the very important yeah. change. Yeah. And Jesse Felder shared this from the Financial Times. The Fed must act now to ward off the threat of stagflation. Well, I think that's too late. Excess demand causes supply shocks to turn into sustained inflation as people struggle to maintain their real incomes. This then leads to stagflation as people lose faith in stable and low inflation and central banks lack the courage to restore it. And Scott Minard says that if the Fed blinks, the dollar will come under pressure. And that's the thing. Uh, central banks are in big uh, trouble if they don't raise rates. If they raise and then cut and reverse, say goodbye to the dollar. And I mean, to be honest, that will be the best thing for us gold and silver uh, holders. And this is interesting from a CEO of a chemical supplier. We hoped to hold our pricing until costs came back down. That was a mistake. Now we are faced with having to catch up because prices are out of control and apparently not coming back down. And this is a problem. And when inflation expectations through consumers becomes ingrained, then central banks are in big trouble. And from Zero Hedge, analysts warn world has just 10 weeks of wheat supplies left in storage. And what have we been talking about on this channel for about a year now? Food shortages, famines. And Jesse Shelder, uh, Felder sorry, uh, shares this chart and asks how much of a sell-off should we expect if the US economy enters a recession? And well, as I say, I think we are in a stagflationary environment right now. And look, 1973 to 75, I talk about this 1973, 74 recession a lot. And asset prices fell 50%. Well, the stock market fell 50%, while CPI remained elevated at 12.5%. And that was caused because uh, the Fed tried to raise rates to battle inflation. And they continue to do so in the middle of a recession. Very similar things happening right now. And I'll put a link in the description below uh, from this Wall Street Journal article, Rescue from Recession Won't Be So Easy This Time. With decades of disinflation, encourage accelerating fiscal recklessness and escalating monetary indulgence, which is what we've had since the GFC, these don't come without a cost, and we're about to pay those costs. The US is on the cusp of stagflation, and markets are yet to fully realize. Stagflation is a dreaded combination of high inflation and low growth. Inflation is running at its hottest for 40 years in the US, and although growth is still holding up, Many economists expect it to slow. And this is from the world's biggest hedge fund that says the United States economy is on the cusp of stagflation. And as I said, markets are yet to fully respond. You don't say own hard assets. And that's what just I was about to say is uh, we're already in stagflation, in my opinion. And uh, as I said in a, in a video last week, uh, Wayne Gretzky skate to where the puck is headed, not to where the puck was. And I know gold and silver hasn't performed right now the way people have wanted. I, I still think it has from when I bought it, but uh, right now in the middle of this inflation outlook, uh, a lot of people don't feel that it's performed the way it should have. However, uh, skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck has been. 
And this is a great tweet from Daniel LaCale, who's an Austrian economist. Uh, it talks about Christine Lagarde, who was on Bloomberg. She said, inflation is caused by supply side. And Daniel points out that inflation in Switzerland with same supply issues is 2.4%, with the Eurozone inflation with monster money printing or currency printing is 7.3%. And Tavi shared this great chart, US corporate bonds year on year change. The last time corporate bonds declined this much on a year-on-year -year basis was during the 1973-74 recession and the GFC. This is a major downwind from crowded 60-40 portfolios. Tangible assets are likely to play a key role in capital allocation. And it's just interesting that people are now starting to compare the 1973-74 recession. And so it's a, it's a part of history that I've studied a lot. Uh, looked at financial markets, looked at what happened in the macro side of things, looked at how asset, different asset classes performed during that period of time. And well, there's a lot of similarities. So how do you play it? How do you invest for a repeat of a 1970s stagflation environment? Well, Christine Lagarde uh, said this with the war uh, is likely to speed up the green transition as a means of reducing dependence on unfriendly actors. So Folks, we are pushing ahead with this energy transition, okay? Uh, this could keep up pressure on prices of fossil fuel as well as those of rare metals and minerals. So everything I've been sharing in, in recent weeks about commodity super cycle, silver super cycle, uh, you know, silver being the next lithium, uh, commodities, 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 and energy. That's where I'm investing. And this from Professor Richard Werner, the present times are similar to the 1970s when central banks created inflation and geopolitical maneuvers were used to restrict supply. Exactly what I've been saying for ever since I started this channel. Covering up the monetary cause. <laughs> yeah, blame it on this. This is, <laughs> anyway. Gold is very undervalued at the moment in my view. It's cheap, has fallen far in inflation adjusted terms. And Daniel Lacale, the Austrian economist I mentioned before, got gold, he says, investing in stagflation, what happened in the 1970s. So let's have a closer look at this chart. So here is the annualized returns for selected financial markets and commodity assets during the 1970s, both nominal and uh, real, so adjusted for inflation. And, well, lo and behold, oil, energy, uh, WTI, Silver, gold, food, wheat, nickel, aluminium, home prices. Strangely enough, copper didn't do well. Um, and that's probably because it's more of a, uh, uh, a, a commodity for infrastructure. So when there's big infrastructure spends and uh, copper gets used a lot. This time I'm bullish on copper because of this energy transition. So everything I'm investing in, energy, Precious metals, commodities, both food and also the the nickels, aluminiums, coppers, cobalts, all of those. I've done videos in, in recent weeks. You guys can go back and have a look at it if you haven't. I suggest you do because I think you're going to get a, if you, look, I'm pretty uh, uh, confident that we are going to see an inflationary decade ahead. We are going to experience stagflation and we're going to see many assets like the 1970s perform well again. And the assets that have performed well over the last 40 years in this bond bull market, I don't think will perform very well. So people need to go back to prior to the beginning of the 40 year bond bull market to have a look at what assets performed well. And so that's how I'm investing. Uh, stagflation is here. Uh, we're an inflationary decade ahead. And you want assets that have got a track record of performing in those type of markets. Anyway, that's my opinion, not financial advice. What do you guys think? Love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If you like this video, please give that big thumbs up. Hit that like button. Really do appreciate it, guys. If you haven't yet subscribed, do so and hit that notification bell. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all again on another episode of Finance Uncut.